We've seen how running our Lambda interpreter and hashling splate gives us an eager variant of the Mo language. But if we run that same interpreter with tilde lazy added to get the lazy variant of splate, we also get a lazy variant of Mo. And that means Lambda is not making eager evaluation explicit. We're deferring the choice to splate. In the case of lazy evaluation in our more lazy interpreter, it doesn't matter whether you run it in the eager or lazy variant of splate. We always get a lazy variant of Mo, and that's because we implemented laziness explicitly. So what we want to do now is make the same sort of explicit choice in our interpreter. We'll implement eager evaluation order explicitly. It won't matter whether you run this new interpreter in the eager or lazy variant of Sprite because we will have made it explicit and implemented it ourselves and therefore hopefully understood it ourselves as well. Consider what happens when we interpret 1 plus 2 with our lambda interpreter. The interp function will dispatch to the plus e case, where it does a num plus on the interp of the two sub-expressions 1 and 2. And then that splate interp function will uh, be called. Meanwhile, splate remembers that once this interp function produces a value, uh, it goes inside of this num plus, and we need to do more work here. We need to interp 2 and then eventually add things together. Sometimes we show this context for an interp call like this using indentation and a trace. But here I'm going to write the current call that we're working on, plus everything that we need to do to finish in another box on the right, and we'll call that the to-do list. Somehow, interp will keep going and it'll eventually give us an int v. Of course, that happens right away. But in any case, once we get a value, what we do with that is put it in place of the dot. So in my to-do list here, this big dot is a placeholder for a value that we're waiting for, and everything around the dot is our to-do list. That is all the things that we need to do in the future. So once we get that nv1 back, we can drop it in place of the dot, uh, which I'm showing here, and then continue on with the interp of 2, which I'm showing here. When we get a value back for this interp of 2, it goes right here. So that's why the dot has moved to the second part of numplus instead of the first plot. Eventually we get an nv2 back from that interp, and we take that value and drop it into uh, in place of the dot, and then carry on. Now with no more calls to interp, just numplus will run and it will actually add the 1 and 2 together to give us 3. What I'm showing as a to-do list can also be called a continuation. In other words, it's how we continue after we get a value back from our current attempt at interp. So this continuation encapsulates all the things that we need to do to finish running the program uh, when we get a value back from the current interp. So in that numplus example, the value goes in place of the dot, and everything we need to do is encapsulated here. We need to interpret uh, the expression too, and then we need to actually add things together. This concept of continuation is not specific to Mo interpreters. Anytime you have a complicated splate expression where there's some function call to be done and work to come back and do after that, splate will manage a continuation or a to-do list of all the things it needs to do to finish running your program. Here we have an example where, again, it's not part of our interpreter, it's just some plus and some times where I've already evaluated the left-hand part of the plus. Uh, on the right-hand side of the times, I have some more work to do, uh, and the dot is a placeholder for a value, but this dot is nested into a uh, compound expression. And you might think of this instead as, we've already done the three, but for the plus, we're doing this whole thing to the right of the plus, and within that whole thing to the right of the plus, we're working on the left. So we could break it out and write it in pieces instead, that inner plus, uh, inner times that we're currently working on, uh, where we're waiting for a value to do the times, and then after we do the times, we plug that into this plus. And so what's going to happen with this view is we're going, as we go more deeply nested, we're going to add things to the top and keep finishing things on the top and working our way back down. Uh, this is why people call the continuation a stack sometimes. So this stack uh, corresponds to exactly the call stack in a language like Java or C. So I'm going to use the terms stack and continuation more or less interchangeably, although in some contexts the implication of a stack is that there's a limit on how deep it can go, uh, and we're not going to have that constraint at all. Our continuations can be as big as they need to be as long as they still fit in uh, all the memory that we have available.